let's pray. I know that God hasn't finished yet. What an amazing presence of God in this place. I tell you guys, I, it never gets old. It never gets old. It never gets old. Let us never become familiar. And I know you're not a familiar church, but I just wanna remind all of us, don't let us get familiar. But let us come with expectation for the Word today because it's the Word that transforms. So would you pray with me? Father, I thank You that You've already shown up as we have lifted Your Name, as we have brought glory to Your Name in our worship. God, we've put You in Your rightful place. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Your Name. Now I ask for Your Kingdom to come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I pray that this Word that is from Your Word, the Word that's alive, that's active, God, the Word that transforms more than any other Word. It is not informative, it is transformative. It carries revelation. It is pregnant with life and life abundant. God, I pray that we would lean in, that we would open our hearts, that we would have good soil ready to receive the seed that will take root and produce produce fruit. God, I pray that as we have hungered and thirsted for Your presence and Your your, your goodness, God, I pray that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that this morning, as we are led by Your Holy Spirit, as we're instructed by Your Holy Spirit, that we would receive Your Word with open hearts. God, open and soften our hearts to receive the Word that will bring transformation and cause this on earth realm to match your kingdom. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen, why don't you take your seats? Oh, I just, you know when you feel the anointing strong, I get a little bit shivery and shaky. (laughs) I love it because um, our bodies are so finite, but His power is so infinitely powerful. If you've ever known when people get slain in the Spirit or fall out in the Spirit, maybe some of you have never experienced that and seen it. It's not weird. It's just that our bodies can't contain the magnitude of the power and the glory of God. We're not, this, this earthly body can't contain what, can, what lives and resides in heaven. And so sometimes we just respond by, I think God's kind. Otherwise we would just be like an electric socket going crazy. But you know, that's not weird. Because what it does, sometimes it, 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 it shifts those things that are inside of us, out of us. It fills us with the power and the presence of God. So anything that is not of God gets shifted, it gets exchanged. And I know that my whole life, I've experienced this from a very, very young age. And kids don't make it up. Kids don't pretend. They don't do the courtesy drops for the adults. I don't care what evangelist is praying for them. If it's not happening, it's not happening. But I remember being a little girl and the power of God surging through my body. Then God giving me signs and visions and dreams and words that have sustained me throughout my walk with God. I don't know why I'm saying that, but I just want us to be expectant. If you haven't signed up for conference, I'm telling you, God's gonna do something. Some of you might have the attitude, well, I come to church every week, why should I have to pay for a conference? I tell you, what you invest in, you receive a reward with. There is something about setting aside time. Please don't be arrogant and proud and just go, oh, I'll just, whatever. No, come with humility and openness, expecting God to move. And I tell you, He will. We don't put these things on for the sake of it. Honestly, it's a lot of work. For our team and our people, we put it on so that everyone else who doesn't get a chance to be at the belonging gets to experience what God's doing in our house. But also it resets the year. I believe it's funny because it's kind of like the Jewish New Year, right? That comes in that time when we are going to conference. I don't think that's a coincidence. We're like going in to something powerful and new and it resets us. And so for those of us that go into that, it's like it sets you on course for a new year. So if you haven't registered, register. Okay, this morning, I wanna get to the Word. Um, You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been back. It's been so good to be back. Um, 
a couple of weeks ago, if you weren't here, I preached on lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, how God wants to turn our, I mean, God wants to use our tests for our upgrade, but how the enemy wants to turn our tests into temptation for our destruction. And normally it comes when we're tested with our words or with life experiences. And then Pastor Henry came and then just added on to that last week and talked about the power of our praise and praise being a weapon that when we're frustrated, when we're going through things, that instead of speaking words of death, we would speak praise and actually see things shift over the atmosphere. Well, as I have continued to live in the book of James over the last few weeks, I'm just so convicted I'm not not joking. If you need a book that convicts you, just read James over and over and over. Chapter one through five, chapter one through five. The best thing to do in these short epistles is you've got to read them from the beginning to the end. Don't just pull out little uh, scriptures that fit your narrative. Read the whole thing. (laughs) Because I tell you, it is going to do something in you. And I just kept reading over and over and I couldn't escape the Holy Spirit wanting to come in with a very, very tender heart, like a true, beautiful, Father, and I feel like that's been the essence of the presence of God, this gentle spirit that wants to come in and bring instruction today. So can we lean in today and allow the Word to instruct us? Are we okay with that? Because our words are powerful. Our words have the power to heal or to destroy. Our words have powerful to bless or to curse. Our words have power to divide or to unite. Our words have the power to paint pictures so that people then see things a certain way. We're made in the image of God and our words are just as powerful as when God said, well, not as powerful as let there be light. He's kind of all power that way. But He's designed us that when we speak, our words form things. They don't just go into the atmosphere and just dissipate. They actually go somewhere, they land somewhere and they either take us up or bring us down. And the title of my sermon this morning is simply watch your words. Watch your words. And as I'm gonna speak this today, I'm gonna stand here speaking it because I've had to receive it first. I'm not speaking this at you, I'm speaking it with you. I'm not speaking it as the expert who has overcome and I'm telling you what to do. I'm speaking this as a servant of God who has learned, is learning and will continue to learn. And so I want us to listen with ears of humility and openness because every single person in this room, every single person watching online struggles with our words. There's not one person in this room that is perfect. So every single one of you today is gonna respond to this message. This isn't a 50% on, I'm not dealing with that. Every single one of us struggle with our words. And the reason I know that is because James tells us so in the Bible. I wanna read to you from um, James chapter three, but before that, I love that Pastor Henry brought the definition of praise last week as favourable judgment. So what's the opposite of praise? It's normally condemning and criticising. To praise is to lift up, but the opposite is to bring down. And it's often criticism, gossip, slander, condemnation. And it's very subtle and it comes in various forms, but it's the opposite of a favourable judgment to be an unfavourable judgment. It means to be critical, expressing adverse or disapproving comments or judgments. Disapproving judgments. Let's read. James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. 
Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. (laughs) Welcome to church this morning. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Wow. Let that just sink in. It's got very, very quiet here in this church this morning. I hope we're lent in, ready to receive instruction because this is a hopeful message, not a judgment message. This is a hopeful message. This is going to change lives. Because what got me is how can we praise God our Father and yet in the same, from the same mouth curse our brothers and sisters who are made in the image of Christ. You might say to me, Pastor Alex, I do not curse. I'm not talking about swear words. I'm talking about cursing those we don't understand, those that don't look like us, those that we don't uh, agree with right now in arenas that we're seeing. I'm talking about what do we say about people that aren't like us? What do we say when there's some sort of envy and, 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 and I don't know, just judgment? We've all done it. And I just pray this morning as we learn the power of lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, that we would not be tempted to speak curses over people who are made in the image of God. That we would not be tempted to sin with our words when we curse ourselves, when we are tempted to seek revenge and when we don't believe someone is doing something right, therefore we think we have the right to bring judgment through our gossip and our slander and our, I'm just giving you a heads up. And I wanted to just take four things from today because the tongue is that thing that apparently is untamable. But I actually believe that we could put it under the submission of the Father and also it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will help us overcome It's the power of the Holy Spirit that we lean into that gives us the fruit of the Spirit. And we're able to speak beautiful things to one another or over ourselves or in the atmosphere. And I wanna give us an assignment today that every time we go to speak something that is not fitting as children of God, James is saying it shouldn't be this way that you praise God with your mouth and then you curse during the week, but oh yep, we praise and I think it's detestable to God because it's hypocritical. 
And this is what James is trying to teach us is that, hey, this little thing in our mouth that's connected to our heart needs to be under submission in order for us to be righteous, in order for us to change things, in order for us to be the children of God that He calls us to be. The first thing I picked up is that the tongue will be accountable and is accountable. Your tongue, everything we speak of, will have to give an account one day and be accountable. You might think that even saying in your own prayer closet or your own little uh, uh, pity party closet that nobody hears, but God will judge every word that comes out of our mouth. Have you ever let yourself sober into that? That every idle word, every flippant word, I mean, this is the one that gets me every time because man, I'm gonna have to stand before God. And He's like, every idle word, every word that you just threw out there, you will have to give an account for. And James is saying here, hey, fellow believers, make sure you really check the check your heart before you begin to teach. And you might be sitting here going, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not the pastor of this house. No, if you're someone who teaches a discipleship, Bible study class, you mentor, you lead, you have some sort of influence, you teach. This is about fellow believers. This is about the church. Be careful because you see what happened in the early church is obviously the teachers replaced rabbis of the old time and they were given that same respect that when you were a teacher, that you were speaking from the mouth of God. And he's saying, be careful when you teach because you're gonna actually be judged a little stricter. And so honestly, you guys need to understand that we take that very, very uh, soberly because I know that for me personally, I'm gonna have to stand before God and make sure that everything that I'm teaching is the Word of God, that it's not my opinion, that it's not my thoughts. And you know what? Over all the years that I've spoken, I know I've said dumb things and they're gonna have to be held accountable. I know that I have spoken sometimes from opinion and I've had to repent and But what it does is it causes me to be sober-minded that as a teacher, as a leader, as somebody who shares the Gospel, as someone who prophesies, who's someone who prays for, who's someone who leads Bible studies, I need to make sure that my words line up with the Word of God because they will be accountable and they are accountable. What does Matthew 20, uh, 12 say? say about that. Sorry, I didn't write that down. But let's read it. Have I got it up there? But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Oh, does that go deep? Is that going to have you thinking before you speak? You see, I'm a little bit like Peter. I speak before I think. My husband has been trying to help me in 24 years. He's like, Al, I really need you to think before, I'm a verbal processor. I think Peter was a verbal processor, an outward verbal processor. He kind of gives me hope. But that doesn't give me an excuse to stay there. I've had to learn, I've had to grow, I've had to repent, I've had to step up in this area because I can't sit there and go, well, that's just my personality because I'm an outward verbal processor, whatever Enneagram number that pertains to. (laughs) It's an excuse. It's like, oh, it's just my personality. No, we're born of the Spirit. We're new creations. And now we have to take on the new reality that God has given us. And we have to show one of the fruit of the Spirit, which is? Self-control, thank you. So we can do it. And this applies to me. So we've learned, number one, the tongue is accountable. And for those of us that put ourselves in those places, you know, there's people who prophesy over people, you're teaching people. Be careful with your words, especially when you're saying, thus is the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Be careful that it's not your words or your manipulation because we will be held in account because we're speaking on behalf of God. Now that's not to put fear in us, but it's to put reverent fear in us. Those who have 
a pure heart and have clean hands. Guess what? That, they're the ones that will ascend to the hill. But that's also when God, He checks us and He wants us to check our heart. Second thing I know is that the tongue is very powerful and apparently it's very evil. <laughs> This small little part of our body has such power. When I was a little bit more immature in my walk with God, my tongue cut so many things. I was awful. When we first got married, my tongue was very, very powerful to cut down. And Henry being so gracious would just lovingly bring that lovely correction. But I said some hurtful things because I was angry. And so my tongue allowed me to sin. I wanted you to feel that pain. I wanted to get angry with you. I wanted you to feel the very thing that you hurt me with. So I wanted to get you back, but that's not a Christian. That's not somebody who has the Spirit of God flowing through them. Our tongue is powerful and it has the power of life and death in it. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. Those who indulge in it, We'll eat the fruit, whether it's negative, you sow negative words, you will reap negative behaviour. If you sow positive words, you will receive positive behaviour and our words form our world, even over yourself, even over your circumstance. Your words have the power to harm or heal. Your words have the power to bring up and they define your reality. Your words have the power to define reality. Words don't just report facts, but they explain their meaning. Negative words about someone will go down to the inmost parts of a person. In Proverbs 18.8, it says, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. What does this mean? It means Those words then go down to the innermost parts of your being and control how you then see a person. So when you're speaking of someone and you're speaking in a negative sense, it goes down to the inmost parts of people and from that moment on, they view that person the way you just described it. And that's why we have to be careful and I've learnt this myself because what happens is, When you want someone on side with you, you speak the words and now you've got an ally. And those allies then join forces and view. And this is where the problem of the church, this is why there's so much church hurt, guys. Because gossip has divided friends. Gossip has divided churches. Gossip, the way we perceive something and then go to spread it to somebody else now shows this person how they should be viewed. And I've had to learn that, say, if Steph were to come to me and say, you know what, Um, Paul did this, that and the other and oh my gosh, against you. He said this, that and the other. You know, before I would eat that and then I would perceive Paul to be against me. Instead of the Lord has had to teach me, unless I hear it directly from Paul, I won't receive it. Because now the enemy wants to lure me in and believe something that may not even be true, but be a perception of. A while back, I had a phone call from someone and they were really upset because I had apparently said something really horrible about them. And when I heard back what I supposedly said, I was horrified. The facts are I would never have used that language so I knew it wasn't me. This person was so affected, but because they had heard it from somebody who they respected, they believed it to be true. I'm glad that that person actually picked up the phone and talked to me because then I was able to clear it up. But what happens when that person doesn't pick up the phone and clear it up? That person now has built a vain imagination that is not even true and now held an offence and what's it done? It's divided. I know that many people have left this church, or I shouldn't say many, some people because of that very thing. And can't we just see the enemy's strategy in this? It's to divide and throw people out. 
not unite. But as believers, we need to get better at this. We need to understand that if we're gonna praise the Lord with our mouth, if we're gonna give Him honour and glory, we cannot be giving out salt water when fresh water, living water is supposed to be coming out of our being. Gossip and words used without wisdom may or may not be true, but are designed to make the speaker and the hearer feel superior to the object of gossip. There's something in humanity, our broken humanity, that wants to feel better when we hear of somebody else's demise. The more insecure you are, the more you love gossip. Because then you feel better about yourself when somebody else is failing. Recently, we've seen the church being attacked in a massive way. And documentaries have been put out. And I remember the Holy Spirit saying, I don't want you to watch that documentary. I don't need for the enemy to put more things in your mind. I want you to pray. But sometimes we get lured in. And then what, would, what do we do? We believe certain things. And now that, that, that documentary or that report or that gossip has now tainted the way we perceive and see people. And it affects us. And then we build a narrative that we, the church can't be trusted. And what's it doing? It's dividing and it's conquering the Kingdom of God. And I'm not saying to be blind and, you know, not, not discern things. I'm not talking about that. But ultimately, if we could actually turn this into a prayer meeting instead of a discussion, we may see some things shift over the atmosphere, over the church and over our lives. Because I've learned that the tongue is powerful and deadly if used in the wrong way. Oh, but the power, the power of the tongue to breathe life and to do good things. Guys, this is what we are called for, to be ambassadors of Jesus, to be ambassadors that bring light and life and goodness and wisdom to every situation. And I'm telling you guys, I'm speaking with you. I'm not speaking at you in this. I mean, Henry brought out Psalm 34 last week. You know, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. But I want you to think about your words this week. How much praise was coming out of your lips and how much slander was coming out of it. How much gossip was coming out of it. How much speculation was coming out of it. How much going over and over the scenario was coming out of it. Or were you praying? Were you giving God praise? Were you giving God glory? Because I had to learn this myself. This is the thing, the tongue is tainted. We are fallen creatures, guys, but I tell you what, that's not bad news because we have the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. See, Matthew 12, 33 says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is, rec is recognised by its fruit. You brood of vipers. This is coming from Jesus, not me. <laughs> How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. The first thing that comes out of your mouth when something happens, that's really what's in your heart. And he's speaking to the Pharisees here. He's speaking to the religious folk. I was watching Remember the Titans the other night with Henry. I'd never seen it before. Can you believe it? Everyone's like, what? <laughs> I'd never seen it. And uh, Henry and I were watching TV on Friday night and I said, oh, let's watch Remember the Titans. And 
It's such a powerful movie if you haven't seen it, but there's this one woman who, you know, the captain of the team is white and then obviously they've merged with uh, black boys and white boys and it's the first of its kind and there's all sorts of chaos and confusion and, and judgment and racism, but there's this beautiful, I mean, the coach who brings that unity together, but there's a bit of a wrestle during it and I just thought this was so funny to me that the, the white mother is, is that the son is saying, I just want you to meet my friend. I just want you to give him a chance. I just want you to get to know him because once you do, you'll see that he's just like me. And the mum literally says, I have no business getting to know him. And then out of the next breath, breath she goes, get ready, we're going to church. <laughs> I was like, ain't that the Christian Pharisee? I have no business meeting him, but get on your clothes and let's go to church. Praise and then curse in the same well. Ooh, got real real quiet. We've all done it. There's no condemnation here. But this is a chance to get upgraded today. Today, this is a chance to see that God is good. You see, that part of the Scripture that says salt water and fresh water can't come out of the same spring. Thank God it can't. And then I thought about our mandate. Our mandate at TB Co is 2 Kings 2.19. It's to clean the waters of the city, the waters that were toxic and polluted and that made the ground barren and unfruitful because of the toxicity from the stream. The main source had been putrefied. There was something that was infecting the flow of water and therefore the water was making the earth barren. But oh, over the last eight years, we've been seeing a cleaning of the waters in the spiritual climate, but what does that mean? You see, Elisha had to put salt, which I think so crazy, salt into the stream prophetically to purify the waters. Now, that little bowl of salt didn't do it scientifically, but it was an act of faith, a step of faith. It was something done in the natural that brought forth the miracle. But what is salt? Salt is a purifying agent. Salt is a healing agent and we are called to be the salt and light of the world. We're supposed to bring flavour. We're supposed to bring seasoning. We're supposed to bring a hunger and a thirst. When we live, people are like, I want what she has. We're supposed to bring that purifying agent. We're supposed to bring that healing agent. That is what the mantle of this house is, to clean the waters of this city. But we're not going to do it if we're still sprouting out curses and blessings from the same stream. We can't praise God and extol His praises and His praise continually being on our lips when we're gossiping, when we're slandering, when we're speculating, when we're conspiracy theorying. But what's the good news? <laughs> The good news for us, guys, is that Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. Oh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Guys, He did it to me this morning. This morning. I have a chance to speak. And I didn't actually speak negative words, but I gave a negative appearance. And do you know the word grumbling in Scripture actually means to roll the eyes? It's not even words need to be declared. A rolling of the eyes, that is just as much gossip, slander and grumbling because I just gave a person the perception, I don't don't agree with that. And I had to repent then and there. See, this is the power of the Holy Spirit straight away. I get the little twinge. Holy Spirit's like, Alex. You're about to preach. This is what I'm saying, guys. I'm preaching this with you. And I had to go and repent. I went straight to the person and I said, hey, I just need to repent. I know I didn't say anything, but I gave an inflection of disapproval. And that's grumbling. Right there, right then. I repent. I get clean. And then in the worship, God, oh, creating me a clean heart. 
Renew a right spirit with in me. Please do not cast your Holy Spirit from me. But give me a willing spirit that will sustain me. God, give me a soft heart that every time I go to open my mouth, I would catch myself and I would reorient myself. And then I would go humble myself and make it right. Because I tell you, the enemy did not win. It's all we have to do, guys. It's very, very simple. You see, we need wisdom. It says here, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. You know what I've realised is most of our negative speech or our cursing or our, I know I'm using strong words, but it is what the Bible's saying. It comes just like James says, there's envy in our heart. There's selfish ambition in our heart. And until we start getting humble about this and actually self-aware that we need to check ourselves and go, you know what, I've got a bit of envy. Do you know what envy actually means? It's really simple. A feeling of discontented or resentful longing by someone else's possessions, qualities or luck. We get jealous. We're like, why are they, why are they blessed? And recently, I've heard a lot of murmuring about certain people who are blessed, but apparently they're sinning. You know, if that's the case, do you know that Jesus is the just judge? He is not gonna let anything go amiss. We've got to stop being the judgment police and let God do the work. Instead, we need to be praying. We need to be truth telling, but we need to be praying. We're not needing to promote how bad everybody is because it's making us look better. And I want you to know this, guys. We are going to be vigilant in this house that we are a gossip free culture. Now, I know people have to talk about things if it pertains to that person if they're involved with that situation. But if they're not involved with that situation, they have no business knowing about it. Wisdom that comes from humility, which is the fear of God. What is wisdom, the beginning of wisdom? It's the fear of God. I think we've lost the reverence again, the reverence that this is an image bearer that I'm talking about. This is somebody on a journey that I'm talking about. This is someone who maybe, if I saw do something wrong today, but if I keep repeating their offence, but that night they got on their knees before God in their bedroom, but I didn't see it. God's forgiven it, but I'm still holding them to the offence the rest of the week. Do you understand? We don't know what happens in the secret place with people. That's between the Holy Spirit and them. We don't always have to see what takes place when we repent in the secret place, but we need to let the fruit speak for itself. But we need to also give people a chance to change. We need to give people a chance to grow. We need to have people come alongside and say, you know what, I'm going to show you and extend the same grace that I would expect somebody to do for me. You know, recently we were talked about on social media platforms and I, I laughed, not for this recent one, but the one before, because there was this talk of, yeah, don't go to the belonging because, you know, my tithe went to... Um, Alex and Henry's private events that they were having and that the church is paying for. And I was literally just scraping my head going, private events? What private events have we done? And then I thought, oh, it must relate to when I launched my book, Tailor Made. Because I'm thinking it was the only event we did after church and we had like a little book release party. Funny thing is, is the facts are, which my assistants and CFOs can tell you that I paid for that little party out of my own money. But it was perceived that it was a church event and therefore the church is paying for it. And now all over the internet, that gossip is hurtful and it's also untrue. But people will believe, yeah, see Alex and Henry, they can't be trusted with the finance because they're using the church's money for their private events. I'm like, what private events? It wasn't private, it was public. <laughs> If people were at church, I was like, come on. 
And I had Jordana do the food and I paid Jordana for the food and Nate and Shelley Griffin actually donated some of the, 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 the um, decorations because I couldn't afford too much. And so they were like, let us bless you, let's help you. So they could even tell you it wasn't the church's money. But isn't it amazing how that one speculation, that one slander of gossip, brings people to already believe and build a narrative that they can't be trusted. So guess what? I'm never going to the church. Do you know what that's doing? That's taking people away from hearing the Gospel and getting saved. That's why it's so hurtful to the body of Christ. But never once did somebody pick up the phone and say, did you use church money for that event? How much would that have helped? And that's what I just want us to see. And I'm not angry, I'm not upset. I'm just using that as a, because I don't actually know who said it. But look, it's all over internet, so it's not private. But it's an illustration to so that's how harmful things can be because that person wanted to show now, it goes down, that gossip went down to the innermost parts of people and controls the way they see someone. I want to finish with this, if the band could come. First of all, let's not ever believe the first report that comes to you. I've learned that there's always three sides to a story. A side, B side, and the truth. (laughs) Because we've always got bias on our side. And we need the wisdom of Solomon, but this is why there's two types of wisdom. There's the wisdom that comes from earth, That's actually demonic because it's anti-Christ. And then there's the wisdom that comes from heaven. Listen to it. Listen to the wisdom that comes from heaven. It's pure, first of all. It's pure. It's peace-loving. It's good. It's considerate, it's submissive. It's full of mercy, not judgment. It's impartial. Wow. It's impartial. That means that we're not taking a side. We're seeing through. It's sincere. Peacemakers, not peacekeepers, peacemakers who sow in peace will reap a harvest of righteousness. James 1, 26 says this, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James 4.11 says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. That means speak against. That means continue the narrative of negativity. For anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you? to judge your neighbour. Who are we full of sin, saved by grace? Who are we who were wretched and destined for a separated eternity without God? Who are we, or what, because we became a Christian and we're now believers, do we think we have the authority to speak against someone who was once just wretched as us? Who are we to judge God doesn't say to judge people's motives and hearts. That's His job. But so many of us are judging motive and hearts instead of judging fruit. We're not called to judge people. We're called to judge fruit. You see, slander means to question someone's authority, to spread hurtful lies about them or even to say unkind, helpful things about them. To judge someone is to assume position of authority over them. James's Jewish readers had high respect for the Old Testament law. And James's point is that to disobey the law by judging another person is a way of putting yourself above the law. 
If you're going to be a doer of the Lord, be a doer. Don't be a volunteer judge of how others are doing. Again, James is urging Christians to walk in humility in our relationship with God and with each other. God's the only judge. And I read something, or I saw something weeks ago actually. Bill Johnson, who's an incredible man of God. There was a little snip of his sermon and I just wanna read as I just wrote down his words. When we criticise gossip or slander others. We diminish our authority to change a situation by not praying about it. To stand before God and criticise another person is a misuse of our authority. We have a divine invitation to enter the courts of God and make a difference through prayer. God will not bless the curses of His priests because that's not our assignment. He is the just judge, the lawgiver. We are not. Could we turn our criticism, our gossip, our slander, our speculation, our perception, our assumption, our misinformation, could we turn that into an opportunity to exercise our authority and begin to pray. Will we this week, even if something comes against us, even if you have hearsay evidence come at you, would you choose to take a minute and not speak, but ask the Holy Spirit, what is my obligation right now? It is to pray. First, it is to forgive my enemy. God, is this a test? Or is this the enemy leading me into temptation to sin by my words? Am I causing a a, a sin to come out because I'm not praising You and thanking You and extolling praise and and, and, and honouring that human that is a image bearer of God or am I judging? I'm gonna leave you with this and I want us to stand actually because I'm just gonna pray over us today. I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit do the work that He needs to do in us. I want us to go home and do the homework. I want us to be convicted and challenged, but then also apply. Because sometimes I think we're trying to apply what God's telling us to do and God's saying, just let the Holy Spirit do the work. James 5.16, he ends in this. He says, therefore, confess your sin to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And the Lord spoke to me so strongly this week. He said, Alex, there are things that you wanna pray into. There are miracles, signs and wonders that you wanna see that you have not seen at the level that you are praying into. You wanna see deliverance, you wanna see breakthrough. Well, I need this vessel to be clean from the inside out. Therefore, I need you to confess your sin and I need you to repent and I need you then to be healed and then your prayers will be effective and your prayers will be like Elisha who asked for God to shut up the heavens and the rain didn't come. Where it says, James, after that, he was just an order man, but because there was a righteousness in Him, He was able to shift the elements. And I believe as a church, we are called to shift the elements over our city, over the spiritual climate, over our families, over our lives. And right now He's saying, watch your words and let the Holy Spirit be so convicting this week that the minute you feel that twinge and that twerk that you will submit that You will obey. And so right now with hands raised, humble hearts that are surrendered to You to say, Jesus, heal me in this area. God, I repent for the things that I've said as my heart has just been a little broken. It's been a little despondent. It's been a little disappointed. It's been a little judgmental because I'm actually disappointed. God, I'm seeing that I've become 
judge and I have put myself on the throne. But I don't wanna be self-righteous. I wanna be righteous. I want the robes of righteousness to be upon me so that I can come in with a wisdom and I can shift atmospheres. And so God, as a church, those watching online, those standing today, me and Henry included at the helm, at the front of this, God, we repent and we ask You, God, to take us to another level. God, ask, oh, we ask that we would begin to see revival, that we would see Your Kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask, God, that You would convict us, that You would lead us and that You would shape us so that we would become mighty. We would look like You, God, because a good tree produces good fruit. And they will know that we are Your disciples when we love one another in deed and in speech. And so Father God, I pray today that the power of the Holy Spirit marinate this Word in each of our spirits so that it would bring transformation in all of our hearts so that we would bring Your Kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Your Name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God glory.